Day 665 of the Ukrainian war map, also known as the Russo-Ukrainian war. Juzzy here, and today is another update as I take a simplified and down-to-earth approach to some of the most important happenings on the ground in Ukraine. So starting off, we'll take a look at those Russian losses, as currently, Russia has just hit the milestone of 350,000 military personnel losses, adding another 1,000 plus in the past 24 hours. And what a perfectly coincidental timed day for Russian news that has informed us that Russian Defense Minister Shoigu has just announced plans to expand the Russian armed forces to 1.5 million personnel. So where have all the Russian soldiers gone to have such a need like this one? Now, let's go back in time to just before Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, as they had about 900,000 army personnel available. Then, in August of 2022, by Putin decree, he added another 137,000 to expand the military to 1.15 million. Then, in December 2023, yes, just earlier this month, also by Putin decree, it was expanded to an extra, uh, by an extra 170,000 to 1.32 million. And then for this new, new news, now today, and I initially thought it was some replay of older news from this month, but it was not stating that Russia now wants to add another 180k or so to make 1.5 million for the Russian personnel of the armed forces. So Russia couldn't even wait to get out of December to announce their plans to do this once again. And I remember saying numerous times in the past on this channel, based on these numbers and more, that uh, I was always very interested to see what Russia would do to either mobilize or get around a traditional mobilization clause. Easy. Just expand the size of your military and even go so far as to state that the new intake is training in Russia and never left the country. Not a joke. This has happened a lot already. Then as for Russian hardware losses in the past day, 14 tanks, 31 APVs, 20 artillery, and not to mention a whopping 48 vehicles. Then we'll move to the Ukrainian map today and we'll head straight to Avdivka as the Russian forces extended positions east of the railway in the northern flank near Krasnorivka. And so this really got me thinking, why doesn't anybody compare the results of Russia's counteroffensive in this region to Ukraine's counteroffensive in the south? I've actually never heard uh, anyone compare these figures yet. And so the raw mathematical numbers are as follows. For instance, Russia's Avdivka counteroffensive has yielded 27 square kilometers of land captured, with most gains around uh, Vodiana in the south and around Krasnorivka to the north. Then, as for Ukraine's southern counter-offensive, it's actually about three times the, the size in square kilometers for liberations. But that's only when taking into account the Orykiv axis, because truly, all of the Ukrainian southern counter-offensive liberations have, in fact, amounted to 270 square kilometers. So, 27 versus 270 Literally 10 times the size. 10 times! And add to that, when put in further context, Russia has lost literally hundreds upon hundreds of light and heavy armor needlessly as a result of their Avdivka operations, not to mention the staggering loss of about 20,000 soldiers just for Avdivka. And so naysayers might argue, but Juzzy, that might technically be accurate, but you haven't included the, the northern Donbass in your calculations. And yes, that's true, I haven't. But had I included the northern Donbass in the math, Russia's performance actually amounted to a net loss of land. When you look at places like uh, Solodar, or just north of Solodar, and just south of Bakhmut, so I've actually taken a pro-Russian approach to these figures, and therefore a conservative approach to the Ukrainian calculations. So, Merry Christmas. Then we'll move down on the map of the Donbass, so moving to uh, Mariupol. 
as explosions were reported by locals, as it appears the AFU continues to use its longer range strike capabilities, such as storm shadow missiles to degrade enemy capabilities in the south. Now, unfortunately, Ukrainian recon drones don't typically operate this deep, so we tend to have a delay on confirmation images from locals or satellite imagery, or even Russian sources uh, to get a better understanding of what's occurred later on. But we're usually expecting in cases like these a, a, a barracks, a base, uh, an ammo depot, or even a, an oil depot. Then just quickly, somewhere in the east, uh, a Russian giant Sint S self-propelled howitzer uh, cooked off after taking Ukrainian counter-battery fire. In fact, this one happened somewhere between Donetsk and Avdivka, to be sure there. Then, on the map, in a similar vein, this time near to Kherson's Krinky region, again, another of the Russian forces' uh, tanks uh, appeared to succumb to a fiery demise. Then, as for the most notable Kherson news for the day, as Ukrainian FPV drones have penetrated a whopping 30 kilometers into the left bank of the Dnipro River, striking at a target in... Abrikosivka. And this is quite significant due to the wider implications of the event. First of all, this depth shows that uh, Ukraine's recent targeting of Russian electronic warfare platforms in the oblasts south has been significantly effective. And secondly, uh, successful Ukrainian FPV drone strikes beyond a 10 or 20 kilometer range have been relatively unheard of and quite uncommon up until now. And thus, for this event, it may indicate Ukraine's technological growth in this space. Now, of course, Ukraine has much longer range drones, but what I refer to here is the frontline drones with the specific classification of FPV, first person view, racing style drones with a live feed and used immersively through a, a goggle wearing Ukrainian operator. Then moving across to some news for the day. So Ukrainian President Zelensky in his nightly address stated that Ukraine is working to improve FPV drones and their usage at all directions of the Ukrainian front lines and that Ukraine will be locally producing 1 million drones next year. In fact, in this month of December alone, Ukraine has scaled up to produce over 50,000 FPV drones already with another 10 days left in this month. Then, in some related hardware news, a team from Krivi Re in the Dnipro Petrovsk Oblast has started mass producing the Cobra drone. And costing around 2,000 US dollars a unit, the Cobra is more affordable than similar ranged drones from Ukraine or abroad as it can fly up to 300 kilometers in range, and which is about 190 miles, and carries a 15 kilogram payload. Notably, it's cheaper than a single 155 millimeter artillery shell, and certainly has the potential to be far more accurate. But this Cobra drone is, is just one of many different types of longer range drones that Ukraine is producing these days. Then in some other news, Japan plans to change its policy and send dozens of Patriot missiles to the United States. This move will help the US to boost its missile supplies and could enable it to send newer missile defenses to uh, Ukraine. Also, as it so happens, Japan in fact manufactures missiles for the Patriot air defense system under license from Raytheon, which is likely to have a longer term positive impact on Ukrainian air defenses also. Then in some other news, and try not to laugh, but uh, as per a TASS media report, the Russian Ministry of Defense has once again tooted its horn with some even more exaggerated claims recently, with Shoigu now stating that the Russian army is the most combat capable in the world, and how also how Russian weapons have displayed supremacy over their uh, Western weapon counterparts in Ukraine. And you see, the problem with TASS media and other Russian state media owned outlets is that they're beholden to the whimsical narratives of the Russian government almost entirely, which means there is no Russian media enforced accountability for the Russian government. 
which has the backfiring side effect of turning a country like that of Russia into one great large echo chamber of BS as they believe their own lies and ultimately make a large number of poor decisions based off that. Then in some other news, Ukrainian hackers going by the name Blackjack have recently launched a cyber attack on Rosvodokanel, a Russian water supply company. Now, this attack, possibly backed by Ukraine's SBU's cyber division, severely damaged the company's computer systems. So the hackers encrypted over 6,000 computers and erased a huge amount of data, including important documents, email security systems, and backups, which caused major disruptions in company operations. As such, the SBU is now examining 1.5 terabytes of data they took from this attack, which is key to Russian infrastructure and the ability to provide services to 7 million people in this instance. Now, beyond the immediate impacts of this infiltration, a cyber operation like this one can have far-reaching consequences for Russia, such as intelligence gathering by gaining access to the 1.5 terabytes of data, which likely includes internal communications, corporate strategies, and details about infrastructure vulnerabilities. That's a big one. Also, it can have the impact of disrupting Russian military resources, as affecting the water supply of a large population could lead to logistical challenges for the Russian government, potentially diverting attention and resources away from military efforts. But perhaps the biggest concern for Russia is how this sets a new precedent for cyber attack risks on such a large scale for the country, which thereby creates the, the chilling effect of a psychological impact by Ukraine, uh, which really sends a message to Russia with Ukraine demonstrating its capability to infiltrate and disrupt critical infrastructure. Then headed across to another Russian military mobilization blunder segment today. So we continue to see reports that uh, puts on display how Russian mobilization uh, equals a one-way ticket, with Russia no longer imposing any one-year service limits on mobilization. So not going home until the war is over, if they're lucky. And it really seems like it's a one-way ticket because even if you somehow make it back wounded to a Russian hospital, like this shining example of quality and cleanliness, we're still seeing report after report that even those with serious injuries and sometimes even amputees getting recycled back into the mix, back into the meat grinder without ever getting classed as unfit for duty. In one notable recent instance related to this, uh, several deputies from St. Petersburg demanded that Putin returns the mobilized home and stop the war. But I guess you could say they saw a window of opportunity to make a stand. Now they just need for them to hang tight. But someone will have to take the fall. Okay, enough with the horrible dad jokes right there. And it's fair to say at this point in Russia, right now, there is certainly some level of waning support for the war in Ukraine. The optics do not look good. Families are asking left, right and center where their fathers and sons are and when they're coming home. And this is happening in the thousands now, it seems. So if I was Putin, I would do exactly what he just did. And that is to get on the propaganda campaign bandwagon once again and put on display him checking out an example of a wounded dummy on a military stretcher on the bottom left right there stating that Russia won't act like Ukraine who is abandoning their wounded in Krinky and then has the hide to say they don't consider them their own people. So he's literally describing the Kremlin's approach to their own. What a fraud. What a super fraud. But he can only lie for so long, even in Russia. Sooner or later, the grim reality of what he has done to Russia will become impossible to hide. And also, I might say, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. As the mothers and wives of the mobilized Russians are, are now increasingly coming out in drones. And they don't actually need to use any sort of brute force to achieve change. All they need to do is to be 
hurt enough to fundamentally change the majority's public perception and sentiment to align with the actual reality of Putin's completely apathetic and wasteful war in Ukraine. Change can sometimes come from the most underrated of places. Then moving off to a, a bit of a quick funny to round it off for today, guys. Not uh, a your traditional funny in the sense of military, but uh, somewhat related. So Russia's first electric car, or the Tesla killer, was unveiled recently. Say hello to Amber by Avtortor. And many took to the internet to express how it should overtake the Fiat Multipla as the ugliest car on the globe. Now, the Russian company responsible for this latest monstrosity stated that it will be 100% made in Russia, but only that it might start serial production in or after 2025. Now, Russia's Avdator group is not actually an automotive brand in the traditional sense even, like Ford or Toyota. Instead, it is a Russian company that specializes in the assembly of cars for various international automotive brands. And it all does remind me of how we've already seen Russia claim that some of their latest combustion engine cars were 100% Russian made only to be pulled apart and found that it was almost entirely 100% Chinese, apart from the badge. Classic Russia. But hey, if Russia claims to make an all Russian electric vehicle car, they should at least start with giving it a Russian name instead of Amber. And perhaps the funniest thing to me is that Russia likely doesn't really even have the manufacturing and industry capacity or capability to build a compelling all Russian electric vehicle at volume. And I'm talking before the war. And yet they consider this ghastly prototype a proud moment for themselves. I am once again somehow just embarrassed for Russia. So that'll be it for today, guys. Thanks again for watching. Please leave a like and comment. I always do appreciate it. Uh, thanks for the subscribing if you have. If not, would really appreciate that too and all the support. And I do hope to see all of you guys there in the next one. Cheers.